Top Bed Talk. Monty Mython here. As we prepare to move into the next phase of the COVID crisis, we're going to be widening our focus here on Top Bed Talk. We will continue to deliver COVID-specific programmes, but we all have a huge additional responsibility as we try to reboot normal services. So although this piece is not directly related to COVID-19, we believe it's information that is crucial to the bigger task of rebuilding the healthcare system as we learn to adapt and live with this new virus. Thank you to our sponsors and to you, our listeners, for helping us to share this important information. Hello and welcome. I'm Desiree Chapel, and this is Top Med Talk. We are here at Anesthesiology 2019 in Orlando, Florida. Now, this is with over 14,000 delegates, the largest ga- gathering of anesthesiologists and anesthesia providers in the world. And I'm joined today by my co host, Monty Mythen, editor in chief. Hello, Monty. How are you? Hey, Desiree. Great to be here, as yeah. always. Enjoying uh, it. Is. it. It's our third ASA. It is our third ASA, yes. Now, on this particular conversation, we're going to talk about the perioperative quality initiative and what the work that they've done with perioperative hypotension and some of the other topics, I guess, related to that. So we have our guest, a superstar on Top Med Talk. I like to call you Andy. Did you know that? Yeah, he wasn't available today, so, uh, <laughs> so I've come along to pitch it. <laughs> so our, uh, our guest today is Professor Andy Shaw from the University of Alberta, Canada. Good morning, and, everybody. And he Afternoon, is um, actually everybody. on the board of Pokey as well. That's so, right, yes. Yeah, so. Thanks for joining us, Andy. You're welcome. Thank you for having me back. Well, of course. (laughs) Always a pleasure to come, especially at ASA. It is, yes. What a great meeting. It's a loaded question from me, Andy, just because everyone may not be up to speed yet. What what is is a POKI and where do you find it? (laughs) Yeah, so POKI, what does it stand for? It stands for the Perioperative Quality Initiative. Um, It's an international, multidisciplinary, not-for-profit organization whose goal and intent is to improve the quality of perioperative medicine everywhere it's practiced, so all around the world. And the mechanism we use to do that is, uh, is a series of consensus conferences. You've been to, uh, to all of them, in fact, um, on, on subjects, on topics of interest related to perioperative medicine and the delivery of perioperative healthcare services. So it grew out of an, a similar acute uh, care initiative, initially focused on renal medicine, uh, called ADKI, the Acute Dialysis or now Acute Disease Quality Initiative. And we had the idea, I guess about... Uh, four years ago now to do something similar for perioperative medicine and um, and since then we have now held uh, seven consensus conferences um, we've focused on enhanced recovery subjects we've focused on fluid we've focused on opioids and pain relief and our most recent one I think is what we're going to talk about li- a, a little bit later on on non-cardiac surgical acute kidney injury. So the output from all of those conferences is published in the, in the literature. We've got something like 20 or so uh, primary publications and accompanying, all, all open source. And accompanying yeah. editorials. Everything is available on the website, www.pokey.org, so P-O-Q-I dot O-R-G. And in addition to the, the papers being available, all of the graphics, all of the images are available open source for people to use in their uh, educational programming, their content, their slides. Uh, and that is a, that's a fundamental tenet of the whole Pokey movement, is that all of the information is available to anybody open source. So heavy, heavy on infographics, so if you go in there yep. and grab an infographic, permission is automatic. Automatically granted. Um, just please, you know, please, please, <laughs> acknowledge. <laughs> please acknowledge and say where it came from. Um, and we, do, we negotiate all of those agreements up front prior to the, con- to the conference. And it's really worked well. You, we're starting to see... The, some of the graphics from the earlier meetings yeah. on people's content. I saw one uh, just this morning, um, and oh, it's, ex- it's very gratifying to see. Yeah. But, but the, you know, the, the old adage, an image captures a thousand words, is yes. really true. And, um, and it's been great to see it, uh, see it grow and develop. Now, we published a series in the British Journal of Anesthesia earlier this year, which was about perioperative blood pressure measurement. So we did pre, <coughs> intra, post, and the physiology, which all turned out to be very, very popular they're all open source via the yep. british journal of anesthesia now one of the, the big discussion points in that was the this threshold of a map of 65 there's a lot right. of emphasis being placed right. on that now and at the meeting there was a lot of support for the map of 65 which came out of large data sets but 
one of the questions was those data sets were dominated by a single organization. So they were dominated by great work coming out of the Cleveland Clinic on lots of patients. But the question always was, will that stand up if you look at a broader sweep? And at the EBPOM meeting in London this year, uh, you, you had a paper, one of your yep. fellows presented, that it does seem as though that number stands up. That's exactly right. Yeah, of course. So, um, so you're absolutely right. Dan Sessler's group at the Cleveland Clinic has, uh, has led the charge in this space. They've published their own uh, data from, just from the clinic, demonstrating exactly what you say, that a map of 65 for a varying period of time is associated with adverse outcomes, with an, by which I mean death, readmission, um, MI, stroke acute kidney injury with an odds ratio of in the 20 to 25 percent sort of range but the problem is it's a single center so our idea was to say let's find a different data source and let's do uh, a similar analysis but not include the the, the the Sessler group specifically because as you know one of the fundamental tenets in good science is independent replication and validation and, and I felt, and I'm sure Dan was a bit upset at the time, but I felt very strongly that if we can reproduce that work completely independently, it will validate the, the, you know, that finding and that concept specifically in something as important as blood pressure, perhaps our most easily but infrequently modified risk factor for adverse outcomes. So um, we went to the Optum data set, which is a, a large EMR-based uh, data repository that from around about 2,000 hospitals, 7,000 clinics, uh, and it's it's got administrative code data in, it's got uh, fluid data, it's got medications, it's got lab values. You said US based. It's right? US based, yeah, yeah. and uh, it's fairly uh, reasonably spread across the country, uh, the USA. There are a few geographical aberrations, notably on the West Coast, as I believe. Anyway, the point is that we asked the question in non-cardiac surgery. Is there an association between intraoperative, the first paper, and the second paper is postoperative, blood pressure uh, control, and adverse outcomes? And so to cut along, so so both of these papers are currently under review in the the literature. Um, The first paper focused on intraoperative blood pressure control, has 370,000 patients was the final surgical cohort. uh, How many institutions? You can probably so the, the individual, the Optum data set has 2,000 hospitals gotcha. in, so m- more than one, yeah, okay. which we thought was important. And I have to say, <laughs> and I still don't know if the Cleveland Clinic is in that data set or not, okay. but right. okay. if it is, there are 1,999 other ones as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. You know, so we excluded people for whom we didn't have reliable data. We excluded anybody having a cesarean section, because that's an entirely different... Uh, extremely important but a different surgical procedure especially from a blood pressure control perspective Uh, we had people we excluded people who we didn't have a touch point in the year before or the year afterwards because we wanted good baseline comorbidity information and then follow-up anybody who had a general surgical operation within three days of a heart operation we excluded and then various other things that basically talk about data integrity and whether or not we had you know uh, enough information to 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 draw any conclusions so we had 370,000 patients in the final cohort and uh, and we examined the incidence of hypotension using five different definitions which will all will all be in the paper Um, and for reasons I'll come on to in a minute it doesn't really matter how you measure or approach hypotension the findings were remarkably consistent and then we controlled for uh, um, demographic issues age gender uh, hospital type location, extent of comorbid disease, uh, and so on and so forth, and then measured the association of blood pressure control in the operating room with subsequent uh, outcomes. And, uh, and so just in the operating room, the, the long and the short of it is, there is no safe blood pressure below 75 millimeters of mercury. 75. 75. Yeah. The risk seems to start at map, 75. Map of 75. Map of 75. The map really, the, the, the index, sorry, the odds ratio really takes off at 65, okay. as we've long thought. And the odds ratios for uh, major adverse cardiac and cerebral events uh, for 65 is 1.17, so a 17% increase in that we think most people would agree that MI, stroke and death are, are important clinical outcomes. So just to pause for a second, the threshold that we eventually published in the paper in our pokey guidelines was 60 to 70 right is 
I think you're saying there's no need for us to rewrite that at the moment. No, absolutely. I think the um, the risk begins at 75, really takes off at 65, and by the time you're significantly below a map of 55, that's when the risk starts to reach the 25, 30, 35 percent. Solomon Aronson from Duke University. Thanks for joining us, Saul. Thank you for having me. Uh, Andy, fascinating, and I love the cohort of 370,000, a lot right. of sub-analysis um, you know, are, are uh, permissive when you have such a large denominator. Um, speaking to the methodology, just for a yeah. second, the, the definition of hypotension, as you would allude to, um, irrespective of index of blood pressure, are these um, episodes of hypotension as one would define by um, magnitude and or duration? And, and are those patients, the 370,000 patients who had that blood pressure um, managed? In other words, is it hypotension irrespective of a subsequent behavior to manage blood pressure, or is it hypotension independent of that? So the, I, the, the answer is yeah, yes, 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 and yes. <laughs> I okay. was just going to say, wow. So, we do, so, let me, so let me talk a little bit about the exposure, which I think is what you're asking is, how, how is it measured? How is it quantified? I, no? Th- where I'm driving, and, and so I, I welcome your response because it might be n- something I'm not even asking and should, <laughs> but, but, but where I was going with that is I think it would be interesting if there was that association irrespective of it being managed. Right. And, and what kind of management... Uh, would be interesting in that do the patients with resistance related low blood pressure have a different outcome compared to the hypovolemic patient with low blood pressure? So we we did not get into whether it was managed or not. We hoped that obviously it was, but with that information is in there. We would know provided it's documented in the EMR. I would expect it would be. And you know, know, I'm, I'm sure this audience are well aware that not not every single dose of neosinephrine gets uh, gets charted, but but we didn't get into whether it was low and then treated or or not. We okay. did we did measure both the the extent in terms of how low the blood pressure goes for how long, the product of that, the so-called um, you know total area under e- each of those thresholds, right. and I should say that the the threshold is the drop from the baseline, which was the most r- uh, uh, immediately available blood pressure prior to induction. So it's a real, and we only included patients for whom we had that information. Um, so, so it do, and, and as I was saying earlier on, it doesn't matter how you measure it, whether you like the total duration, whether you like the absolute depth, or, or whether you like a relative drop, although the absolute numbers actually turned out to be more, um, more I guess, predictive of, of subsequent adverse outcome, which we liked because if you don't know yeah, right. what the baseline number is, then a 10% drop in MAP, what does that mean? People find that hard to, totally agree. to it's, relate to. It's, it's uh, more simple. Another point of clarification from the methodology. Yeah. Um, when, you, when you say your signal began at, at a 75-ish threshold, yeah. which is a little bit higher than we yeah. had yeah. previously yeah. presumed to be meaningful, did you link that to baseline blood pressure. In other words, yeah. a, a theory is those people who come hypertensive would have their thermometer set uh, with a shift to the right. Yeah, that's so. So that change, it, the absolute change, is is just from you know whatever the number is. It's an absolute number of seventy five. The relative change, however, is linked to that starting baseline. Ah, so and so, but it is not as clearly linked as the absolute numbers. For uh, precisely that reason, this idea of white coat hypertension immediately before you go to sleep, do you have a bigger drop with induction or not? Um, So, so yeah, it doesn't matter how you measure it. The risk seems to begin below a map of 75. And that's why I think that's really important. That is right. It is. Because if it's a little bit higher, but it's no surprise that we were right in that 60 to 70 sort of window before. But here comes in a, a, a completely independent, we think, but I would say that, I'm the lead author, <laughs> methodologically very tight um, observational you know, uh, study t- to look at this hazard because it's modifiable, because it happens in every operating room around the world. One quick comment about, about the, the design of this type of research. People are, will always criticize observational research because it's potentially confounded, and that's absolutely yep. true. When you look for a hazard like this, it's much more robust to confounding than when you look for a benefit because physicians, nurse anesthetists, perioperative healthcare providers never set out to do harm. 
they always set out to do benefit. So if you happen to find evidence of a hazard, arguably it's much more robust to sort of missed confounding. Um, we actually developed a model to predict hypotension in about two-thirds of the patients and validated that model in the other third, and it was extremely robust, about a C-statistic of about 0.9. So the modeling side of this work is, 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 is tight. Um, Can you give us some clues on which sort of things were predictive? Obvious yeah, things all the or? usual suspects, comorbid disease, extent of, uh, uh, of, uh, of surgery, and even if you control for the duration of the surgery, uh, the, the bigger, more complex procedure, older people. Interestingly, people with preoperative hypertension, and I think that's what you were, that's what you were alluding right. to. Yeah. And, and everyone blows, you know, the, the, the old joke about avoid hypoxia and hypotension, <laughs> well, guess what? Turns out, it's you know, for real. it's for real, exactly. <laughs> But, you know, blood pressure is such a simple concept, but so difficult to optimize and manage both in the community and specifically in the periop setting where patients get confused about should I take this medicine or not that? And you can get different advice from different members of the same group. So this is a, is a space that is incompletely developed, we think, because of this new data, very important. And, and modifiable. And, and I think it might just be boring old blood pressure, but it really, really matters. Just one thing, just before, to, to, before you ask your next question, Sol. The overall incidence of a map of less than 65 is about 20 to 25%. So every fourth operation, it has potentially, you know, has, has, has evidence of a modifiable risk factor. And it's not just a sore throat, you know, or a bit of tummy yeah. ache afterwards. It's MI, stroke, death, acute kidney injury. Sorry, Sol. No, I, fascinating data, and congratulations on, on this study for sure. Hope our reviewers are listening. <laughs> um, uh, for those of you who are listening. But, but I think, I think you, you teased on a point that we spoke about before yeah. the session, and I think it deserves uh, focus. A hazard uh, index is um, perhaps, as you state, easier to demonstrate than a beneficial yes. one. Really important point. The, 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 the concern, if you will, is, is to leap too far forward too quickly yep. and to presume that this commonly observed thing called low blood pressure, now we know the definition of that better, um, is, is something we can mitigate by our behavior and, and reverse, if you will, that hazard index. And I think, I think that's not what you showed. And I think it's really important to, to right. state that clearly. Because right. the next step is a more challenging step, necessary, but it isn't what you showed. And I think we need to make that point. Yeah, I, I agree. What, I, I think it's the job, and we've done this before with antifibrinolytics, with fluid type. The role of this sort of research is to put a red flag up the pole and say, hey, everybody, this is really common widespread interventions and, uh, or, or risk factors, and they are potentially contributing to a modifiable problem. And that, that's the role of this work. It's not to say you need to be above X or above Y for this type of surgery or not that, or importantly, or, or, or even how you get there. Our job is to, is to raise awareness and say, this is a thing, it's a problem, now let's do it'll be a different type of research to investigate how best to mitigate it. We don't even know, Sol, if you do prevent this, is that associated with an improved outcome? Exactly. Because if this is all confounding, and I'll say publicly, I cannot believe it is, we've tried so hard to, uh, to, to find those confounders. If there's something that we've all missed, that Dan has missed, and Dan doesn't miss very much, as you know, that is causing a 25% increase in the incidence of stroke, death, and, you know, readmissions, that, that, and we've missed it, then shame on us. I, it, it's not really plausible. It's possible, but I don't think it's probable that we've missed that. Well, fair enough. Very, very important point. I, I think there's something teleologically yeah. inviting about making that, that sort of causality association, but I think we, we have a burden and responsibility. Oh, absolutely. To that. Absolutely we do. Uh, but you're right. It's so attractive to think, oh, if low blood pressure is bad, all I've got to do is prevent low blood pressure and then everything will be good. That is almost certainly too simple. Well, you have to figure out what, you know, right. dive a little bit deeper into it. I, I think it's so interesting because I think what this study does and what I think we as, as anesthesia providers specifically, and, and for me, you know, going into the OR every day, I mean, it has made me think about that because I don't think about blood pressures, you know, being it's like 70 and 75. I'm like, ah, they're fine. But then now I'm, you know, I'm much more aware of it. And the fact that 25% of our cases, you know, experience hypotension, 
sometimes you'll be like, oh, I'm so surprised. But if you think back to it, I'm not surprised. I so, know this. <laughs> so the, the, the other paper, the, the partner paper, if you will, focuses on post-operative hypotension. Because this first paper just looks at intraoperative hypotension. But everybody knows you put the patient in PACU yeah. or and then off to the floor and then nobody pays attention. We're gone. And <laughs> so we found a cohort of patients, about 16,000 who were hypotensive, both in the OR and in post-op, but another 70,000 patients who only became hypotensive post-operatively. And, and so the, I'll give it a little bit of it away. The, most of it occurs in the first 12 hours. The outcomes are exactly as bad. The odds ratios are exactly the same. I, so I would have thought, my hunch would have been it would have been worse. It's, it's, not. It's, it's not, I mean, it's, it, it, it's in the 15 to 25% sort of yeah. odds ratio range. So even if you're not hypotensive in the OR and you go off to the floor and you become hypotensive, still a problem. And if you're hypotensive both in the OR and in recovery, then it's, an, it, it's not just an additive problem. So there is a little bit of interventional pilot work in that space, right. which I've shared before on behalf of... Right. Guy Ludbrook and Bernard Riedel, they did this longitudinal study in Australia, which I've seen the results presented, where they had all their major surgical patients going back to the floor, and they were getting very few METS calls, very few alert calls. So it was rare that somebody apparently was deteriorating on the floor. They then kept them all in PACU for 24 hours, and one in four people had a METS call, and it was most commonly a blood pressure drop that they right. then treated with fluid <coughs> followed by pressors with monitoring. And outcomes were dramatically better. Yeah. It's only a pilot study. Yeah. That sounds like a smart study. Design. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so once again, it's not, it's, it's not okay for us to just drop people off in PACU and then wander back to the OR. Someone needs to be paying attention. And I think, you know, we're perioperative uh, physicians, perioperative care providers. That is our responsibility. It doesn't just stop at the door of, 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 of recovery. If all soul comes back in, do you think we could, the potential is that we could filter that 25% out? Because then looking after them, very carefully uh, is a better value proposition even if we filtered half out you mean you mean if we reduce half of the observable if, if, risk is it if, if we could identify the 50 percent for example that were the high risk group which yeah. i think you're referring to with your yeah. scoring yeah i get the impression that if you have intraoperative hypotension that you're more likely to get post-operative hypotension but you said it can be exclusive. yeah not, not necessarily there are patients that that have uh, one of each, and there yep. are patients that have both, there are patients that have, that have none. In fact, the number of people that get away with an operation and a post-op recovery period and without an episode of hypotension are actually is, is the minority. Right. Oh. And, and that's, you know, that, that's us looking at our own practice and saying, you know, we ought to and we can probably do better. So, I, I, again, the, the denominator of 370,000 is uh, significant in that I'm screaming for sub-analyses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the question that I would ask you to ask with that data set, and, and, it, and, it, and it goes to my DNA of <laughs> blood pressure, vascular biology, and physiology, yeah. is the, the, the type of blood pressure itself is um, meaningful. I think it portends different... Um, pathophysiology of vascular circulation. And so hypotension is not hypotension is not hypotension, just like hypertension. And, and so when you, you speak to the odds ratio of end organ dysfunction, albeit head, heart, or yep. kidney, there, there are different perfusion driving pressures right. that are material when you, when you look at uh, pressure as a, um, a component of, of perfusion. I, I would love to know to be more elegant, to be more physiologic, is, is it meaningful in that subset of hypotension mm -hmm. patients if, if the diastolic was more likely to portend uh, myocardial dysfunction outcome, was systolic more likely to portend cerebral dis, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I, I think um, I, I weight that analysis because yeah. I think it's meaningful. Yeah, that data is, it, this is, this is MAP, remember, but, but right. that, it was derived from a systolic and a diastolic. So that, all of that information is in there and available for all different operation types for each different outcome. The interesting thing about, and what we haven't really talked about is the concept of dose response. But the, when you see the figure in the, in the manuscripts, you'll see that for every outcome, 75, 65, 55, there's clear evidence, well, it's not really a dose, but an exposure severity, if you will, and response in terms of increased odds ratio. Which blood pressure is the most important is really matters. I, I agree with you, and I have no idea. But you have to choose one for, for operational purposes for doing the research. But, but 
with the advent of large, wide-scale EMRs, we have that information now. We can know the answer to that question. All we have to do is ask it. So certainly preclinically, in other words, in the human physiology lab and in the animal laboratory where you can control all of these variables much more closely, you know, hypovolemic and or low flow hypotension is much more damaging, as you might guess, to end organs yep. than hypervolemic, high Specifically, especially the gut, for exactly, example. Exactly. The yeah. gut, you know, if you're just slightly hypovolemic and you squeeze, you're, you're starting to kill the gut. And the kidneys are shortly behind. But that's the bit. Yeah. The brain is, you know, hierarchically is the most protected. Yeah. So. And it, we've evolved across millions of years to, uh, to, to, do, it, to, it, to protect the brain. Right? And, and, of course coming to this through the lens of cardiac, which is where I yeah. live, you know, the patient with, you know, increased LV mass and a thick hypertrophied ventricle who experiences just a little bit of diastolic pressure that we would otherwise presume to be not, you know, relevant. Um, I, I, I'm curious, is, is there a predilection for that patient who has diastolic hypotension to more likely than not have myocardial dysfunction as... Right. I, and, I don't and, know the answer and, to that. And, and, and similarly to the kidney with yeah. respect to its... Uh, markers of perfusion that are uh, so I, I think index specific with the kidney it's even more subtle than that because I think the relationship between whatever the right perfusion pressure is be it MAP diastolic or whatever and CVP the back pressure on the kidney is really important right. not because it's back pressure on the glomerulus because of course it's not but it is the back pressure on the soft kidney inside the tight capsule so this idea of the you know, the Monroe Kelly doctrine also applying to the kidney, I've always thought is a problem. And, and you see it clinically, patients with right heart dysfunction and a high, pee, yeah. high CVP, get control of the CVP, mysteriously they start peeing. On that point, Desiree, are anyone to come in? Because I know we're against time. We yeah. promised to just mention briefly the uh, pokey ad key meeting. Yeah, so that was the most recent in our series. It was in conjunction with our, if you will, big brother, uh, the ad key organization, to, to look specifically at um, post non-cardiac surgical acute kidney injury and I think the thing I was involved in the definitions group the thing I will mention as, as being of most interest is is this concept of post-operative acute kidney disease now like scuba AKI has kind of become a word right some people think it stands for injury some for insufficiency but everyone knows what they're talking about but there's a group of patients between about seven days where the KDGO criteria definition for AKI stop and then before 90 days, which is where the, the if you still have re renal dysfunction at 90 days, that means you have CKD by definition. There's the a space chronic, in there. Chronic kidney yeah, disease. chronic kidney disease. There's a space in there where we don't really have a good way of thinking about. And the suggestion from the group is going to be that acute kidney disease, which is tracking what happens in the non-surgical community, is the phrase we should use for that. So it's disease that sort of starts developing in the first week, either persists... Or, 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 gets, or starts afterwards. And the rationale for that is if, if on post-op day 9 or 10, if you've been perfectly fine from a renal perspective and now you suddenly develop AKI, that's probably not post-op. Pr I mean, it is from the concept, from the fact that it happened after the surgery, <laughs> frame, but it's yeah. not related to the surgery. So I think the, when the results come out, as I think they're going to come out, the way they're going to come out, one of the yeah. big probably the, one of the most detailed discussion points was about post-operative screening. You know, recognize everyone. I think yeah. most people are, are, are aware now, even if they haven't logged it properly, that there's no such thing as a benign perioperative creatinine bump. Right. It always means something. Right. And, and not an insignificant number of those patients go on to get AKD and then go on to get CKD. Right. So the lifelong price of it is huge. Right. The big missing part of the equation, a bit like post-operative blood pressure measurement, is we're not necessarily screening for what happens right. to the patient who gets the creatinine bump. Right. And the other thing that we don't do is follow people up. Exactly. So and so one of the outputs from this meeting is, is the concept of the kidney health assessment, which is a combination of uh, renal function and structure. And it can be as simple as a urine dipstick and measuring the urine output, but, or as complex as real-time optical GFR and or some of the novel uh, you know, cell cycle stress Biomarkers. But, but as a minimum, I had if I had uh, a 50% increase in my creatinine post-operatively, right. someone should make sure that gets better. Yeah. And further down the line, someone should dipstick my urine to make sure I don't have new proteinuria right. and now have damaged Absolutely. beans. Absolutely. So, right. so we are a big cause of ongoing 
chronic kidney dysfunction. And this meeting and this idea of AKD and the kidney health assessment, the combination of structure and functional assessment, which can be, if it's a dipstick and a measured urine output, you can do that anywhere in the world. So it's agnostic to income level, if you will, but, but, but conceptually still valid. And you could do it for yourself, can't you? Yeah, pee, absolutely. Pee and absolutely. Go buy some yeah. dipsticks and, 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 you know, exactly Amazon. as you say. They're on Amazon. And, and, and if I could just <laughs> sort of uh, connect the dots of a topic that's near and dear, perioperative medicine is population health. Yeah. Right. As, right. you know, demonstrated and, and by this. Relation. very few things uh, uh, demonstrate that, that clear relationship better than this. The, yeah. the, the depth and the ugliness of the scar of AKI becoming AKD and then CKD right. it's a really ugly scar and you don't, you don't feel it and it doesn't happen to you for a, often for a few years to come and then the burden that is related to that Huge. is horrible. You know, people talk about AKI as the commonest disease that you've never heard of <laughs> and go. because people don't come in saying oh doctor my kidneys hurt you know, they, they, and, and that's a real problem. You know, this concept, people tried to talk about renal angina, renal angina, to try and demonstrate, you know, the, the fact that there is this pre-stressed uh, or pre-injury syndrome, which can be picked up, if, uh, but only if you look for it. Yeah, and we don't, definitely don't do enough of that. Um, wrapping up, a couple takeaways from that. You said um, that it's easy that for follow-up, you know, dipsticks, but what, was, what were a couple other takeaways from um, that ad key pokey? Regarding I, mean, I think the executive summary of the intraoperative component of it is look after people as well as you can. Now, we say we're doing that already, but the greater awareness of both volume, flow, and pressure, yeah. yep. and avoiding hypoxia and hypotension is very real. Right. A- and it's very real. You know, we're just recognizing the fact that it's a lot of instability. I, I think it underscores that we are, we are really at the nascent stage of the science of perioperative medicine, yeah. and that this is a signal that right. is screaming for us to understand cause right. and an appropriate response now that we know the signal is real. Yeah, but I think we think this sort of work, this thinking, demonstrates to the larger medical community who we are, what we do, why it matters, the fact that it is population medicine. It's not just dialing a vaporizer in the operating room. And for those people who are listening that are struggling to see the value proposition of perioperative medicine, this is it right here. And there was no clever... Well, there was clever new science alluded to. Certainly not clever, Monty, yeah. as you know. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, we might see stem cell therapies in the future, but yeah. everything that we came up with is basically extracted from the KD Go yep. existing guidelines. Exactly. And then it's avoid the poisons and look after the tissues. Yeah, it sounds so obvious and so easy to do, but we just seem not to do it. And I think that's an important message is it doesn't need to be high tech or expensive and it can't be if we're going to improve care surgical care around the world it has to be simple it has to be fundamental and and it turns out that there is important work we can do that doesn't need to cost a fortune and it's that's a, what we're trying to point out i love metaphors i love analogies I, it, it just helps me um think about the lighthouse if you will as a symbol of this society right. Right. Um, and we've uh, we, we haven't drifted so much as we've just um now are taking this to another dimension. We're taking yeah. this to a much more sophisticated derivative of what that means. Um, the specialty is alive and kicking. This you know, need to be vigilant is ever so important. We're just defining vigilance in a, in a level of sophistication that heretofore hasn't been our calling. L- last thing I'll say, uh, because we were in the room with a lot of nephrologists and experts as well, there is no such thing as a bit of a creatinine bump that is normal (laughs) it is not normal it does not need to happen it is potentially completely avoidable so if you see it in all of your patients you're doing something wrong yeah you can't you can't ignore it yeah you shouldn't just say it's a just a little bump it'll go away yeah uh well, you guys, that's a fantastic conversation. Thank you very much. We could continue, I'm sure, yep. <laughs> as usual. Andy. Clock has run out on us again. <laughs> as usual, yeah. Um, thank you again. You're uh, welcome. For, Thanks for the opportunity to come and talk about our work. Well, it's always and not just my talk, but thank you for all your work. This yeah, is well, great stuff. Yeah, well, thank you for having us. It's, it's been uh, great. It's been good stuff. So, um, Top Med Talk listeners, thank you so much for everyone that listened. 20,000 More listen. downloads this week than there are people at the ASA. <laughs> which is that's uh, quite a week and only, we only 19 and a half thousand of them have been from you right <laughs> <laughs> all of easy, you easy every one of you 20,000 listeners out there thank you <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah so be sure to subscribe to our newsletter and uh, follow us on social media and all those good things we're around and uh, we'll be back with you at one o'clock today with Mike Scott thanks so much for listening super Cheers. thanks Top Med Talk hi Top Med Talk friends 
I wanted to let you know that we have some very exciting news. EBPOM London 2020 is on. We will be having the meeting. It will be the original dates, June 30th through July 2nd. And we're going to mix it up a little bit. So be sure that you visit our website at ebpom.org. That's E-B-P-O-M.org. You'll get more details. We are going to be offering uh, content, on-demand content, as well as live content, all the most amazing speakers that you ever hear at all of our EBPOM events. So that's super exciting. It's only 150 pounds and uh, you will have access to all of our content for that. So be sure to check us out again, ebpom.org. We're super excited about everything we have to offer this year. All of our same speakers, all of the same quality that you would normally get at a live meeting in person, Um, but you can stay in your jammies. So be sure to check us out. Uh, Thanks so much for listening and hopefully we will see you at Live from London, EBPOM 2020.